Hello, and welcome to the Forgotten Irish Podcast, an occasional podcast series exploring the stories and the history of the Irish diaspora. I'm your host, Damien Shields. Thanks for joining me on this first episode of the Forgotten Irish Podcast. For those of you who don't know me, I'm an archaeologist and historian who specialises in social military history and archaeology and also Irish immigration to the 19th century United States. I'm hoping to use the podcast to explore the history of the Irish diaspora through the medium of personal stories and at the same time to raise awareness within Ireland of these people's lives. A lot of my work focuses on how US military records can tell us about the experiences of mid-19th century Irish emigrants to the United States. Listeners can expect more of that in future podcasts, but on top of that, I'll be exploring a wide range of other topics associated with the Irish diaspora. Though this is the first podcast, you can find a lot of my work elsewhere on the internet. My website, www.irishamericancivilwar.com, has hundreds of articles and resources relating to the Irish experience in the 19th century United States. Irish in the American Civil War also has a YouTube channel, where you can find videos related to the Irish diaspora and Irish archaeological topics. If you'd like to support any of my work, I maintain a Patreon page, which you can find at www.patreon.com forward slash Irish ACW. Today is the 6th of June 2018, the anniversary of the D-Day landings in Normandy in 1944. This first episode of the podcast takes a look at some of the Irish Americans and Irish Canadians who played a part in those momentous events. I hope you enjoy it. Hundreds and likely thousands of both native Irish-born and members of the Irish diaspora participated in the D-Day landings and the Normandy campaign. Somewhat surprisingly, little research has been undertaken into Irish men and Irish women in the US and Canadian forces during the World Wars, and those in search of their stories can face a difficult challenge in uncovering them. However, Just because they're hard to find doesn't mean that they're not there, and they're in abundance. Wherever North American forces were deployed in Normandy, be it land, sea or air, Irish connections can be found. On D-Day, the US forces were responsible for the two westernmost beaches of the invasion, Utah and Omaha. In addition, two airborne divisions were dropped on the Cotanta Peninsula. The high command responsible for these troops was sprinkled with a liberal helping of Irish Americans. Examples include Major General Joseph Lightning Joe Lawton Collins, the son of an Irish immigrant, who commanded the 7th Corps, which included the 4th and 90th Divisions assigned to Utah Beach, and the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions. They also include Brigadier General Jumpin' Jim Gavin of the 82nd Airborne, another son of an Irish immigrant, who parachuted in with his men on D-Day and later went on to command the division. Yet another Irish-American D-Day general was Anthony McAuliffe of the 101st Airborne, who later in the war, as acting commander of that division in Bastogne, would become famous for his one-word response to the German demand for his surrender. Nuts. But the story of D-Day and the battle for Normandy is one best told through the experiences of the ordinary soldiers who were there, Some of the most vivid come from Irish Americans of the 101st Airborne Division. Belfast native Jack Agnew was a member of the Filthy 13, the first demolition section of the HQ Company 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment. Their wartime service would later inspire the film The Dirty Dozen. Jack was one of those who jumped into Normandy sporting fearsome mohawk haircuts and war paint. He later described how, amidst the heavy flak over Normandy, the pilot, and I quote, just dumped us out. They dumped us out, our plane, right over saint com de mont and a whole battalion of Germans. In the process of making the approach, flak came up through the floor and busted Billy Green's chute open, so it just billowed all over the place. So we pushed him on the side to get out. Everybody that went out before us was dumped right on saint com de mont and got either killed or captured. On the ground, Jack and other survivors had to adapt quickly to try and take their objective with much reduced numbers. There was no room for sentiment. He continued, I met some other fella, and he was whimpering and crying terrible. I said, 
If you don't stop all that damn noise, I'll shoot your ass right here. And I meant it, because he was going to get about ten guys killed. He didn't want no part of me, so he took off. What remained of Jack's demolition section then went about their job, which was to disrupt German reinforcements from reaching Utah Beach. Jack says, The first thing we had done was blow up the power lines between Carentan and Cherbourg, and then we found a manhole with a telephone cable and we blew that up. Our objective was to take the bridges over the Douve River from Carentan to the beaches, and this particular big strong wooden bridge that tanks and all could go over. We had taken our objectives, so next thing we knew, here comes our own planes in, bombing us, right on our bridge. They killed about six more men. But we finally blew the bridge up. Anyhow, that was our objective, and that was the objective we took in Normandy. Only four men left to do the job. Another Irish American in the 101st was Ed Tipper. Ed had been born in Detroit in 1921 to Irish parents. His father was from Dublin. When he was three, the family moved back to Ireland, living for a few years in Toomey Bridge, County Antrim, before returning to the States. Ed dropped into Normandy as part of the now-famed Band of Brothers, Easy Company, 2nd Battalion, 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment. He remembered the drop. Out of the plane, the opening shock was so great it ripped my musette bag off. I went down almost immediately. I went right through a tree and landed unhurt. I had my rifle in three pieces in my pack, and was holding my bazooka. I don't know how I was able to hold on to it, but I did. When I landed, I heard another guy shout over to me. We had these passwords. Welcome, Flash, and Thunder. But instead of using the password, he yelled, Tipper! It was Frank Mellet, later killed at Bastogne. We met some troopers, probably five or six more. I didn't know any of the guys we were with. We eventually wound up with another 18 men. I didn't know any of them except Mellet. We met one German patrol and had a short firefight. They had too much firepower for us, so we backed off. We didn't have any automatic weapons, just rifles. They did. While Jack and Ed were fighting behind the beaches, the seaborne assault waves began to move in. Nowhere in Normandy on D-Day matched the horrors that were experienced by American troops on Omaha, where the sands were soaked in blood as thousands of casualties were sustained. One of the very first to die there was Joseph Flanagan, whose mother was from near Ennis Diamond in County Clare. Joseph was a US Ranger, one of those assigned the task of assaulting the Point d'Auc battery which threatened the Omaha landing area. Many of the Irish Americans who survived D-Day would fall in the days and weeks to come fighting in the Normandy Bacage, where casualty rates would rival those of the First World War. One of them was Charles Durning, a private in the 386th Anti-Aircraft Battalion. Durning's father, an Irish immigrant, had joined the US Army in World War I to gain his citizenship and lost his leg during that conflict. He died when Durning was only 12 years old from the effects of mustard gas. Charles had arrived in Normandy via Omaha Beach and was wounded by a German bouncing Betty mine around the 15th of June. He survived his injuries and after the war would become a famous actor. He would later remark of his Normandy experience, There's not a day goes by I don't think about it. I can't talk about it. I don't even talk to my children about it. Certain things in our lives we can't share. 39-year-old Gregory Muldoon, a painter from County Cavan, had come ashore in the first waves at Omaha Beach as a private in the 116th Regiment, 29th Infantry Division. Gregory survived the horrors of D-Day, only to fall in the fighting around San Lo on the 14th of June. His mother and sisters back in Ireland held a service to remember him, producing a mass card in Dublin which stated simply, In loving memory of Gregory Muldoon, America, Chicago, killed in France, fighting with the American army on the 14th of June 1944. The fighting in Normandy would also put an end to Ed Tipper's war. He and Easy Company were among those assigned with clearing Carentan on the 12th of June when German mortars began to rain down. I was standing in the doorway when this blast hit me. It knocked me back. I didn't feel any pain, though my right eye had been destroyed by the concussion and both my legs had been broken. Strangely enough, I was still standing and didn't drop my weapon. Joe Liebgott ran across the street. You've just been hit by a mortar shell, he said. Sit down. I reached up. My helmet had been blown off. My head felt like a watermelon, swollen and mushy and blood was everywhere. 
I was in shock and my muscles had all tensed. That's the reason I was still able to stand and control everything. I sat. Several of the guys had seen the hit and thought I was dead. Eight or ten months later, I visited Floyd Talbert's parents back in the States. They wrote to Floyd and said that Ed Tipper had come to visit them. He wrote back saying, that's impossible. He was killed. I saw it. Whoever's claiming to be Tipper is someone else. He couldn't believe I was still alive. To the east of the American beaches, sandwiched between the two British landing areas, 15,000 men of the 3rd Canadian Division and 2nd Armour Brigade struck Juneau Beach. Eight kilometres of sand in front of villages like Saint-Aubin, Bernier, Courcelles-sur-Mer and Grey-sur-Mer. One of those who splashed ashore in the first wave of Canadian troops was 42-year-old Lance Sergeant William Francis Stewart from Remelton, County Donegal. In different circumstances, William might have been an officer on one of the British beaches, for he was the eldest son of Sir Harry Stewart, a baronet. But financial difficulties had led many of the family to emigrate, and in the 1920s William had headed for a new life in Canada, where he married and took a job as a longshoreman. On the 6th of June 1944, his mother, Lady May, still made her home in Letterkenny. Her son led a six-man engineer team, part of two platoon, sixth field company, Royal Canadian Engineers in support of the Royal Winnipeg Rifles. Hitting the sand near Courcel, they had a torrid time as they struggled through mortar and machine gun fire, taking heavy casualties in the process. William made it through all this, only to be struck down and severely wounded by a sniper late in the day. The Donegal man was taken to a field dressing station, but died in the early hours of the 7th of June. He was initially buried in an isolated grave in the orchard of Mr. Goudville in grey sur mer On the 16th of June, his wife, Lucy, back in Vancouver, received the following. 4959, Minister of National Defence, deeply regrets to inform you that K29061, Lance Sergeant William Francis Stewart, has been officially reported wounded in action, 6th of June, 1944, and died of wounds, 7th of June, 1944. Stop. If any further information becomes available, it will be forwarded as soon as received. Director of Records. Exactly one year later, Lucy received notification of what would be coming home of her husband's personal possessions. The list was as follows. One fountain pen, everybody's. One ever sharp pencil, Schaefer's. One gold wedding ring. One leather wallet. One cigarette lighter. Photos. The remarkable detail we gain into the deaths of men like William is derived from the Canadian World War II service files of the war dead, which documents the nearly 45,000 Canadians who lost their lives. At least 136 of these files relate to Irish-born men, like William Francis Stewart, who lost their lives in Canadian service. He was far from the last Canadian Irishman to die during the Normandy campaign. Some of the files contain insights into the personalities of these fallen Irish soldiers. So we learned that 34-year-old Martin Crawford from Ballycastle, County Antrim, a private in the Calgary Highlanders, was a friendly man of above-average intelligence who played football and rugby in Northern Ireland and enjoyed hunting and social activities. Martin was killed in action on the 22nd of July 1944 during Operation Spring, likely at the Battle of Verrier Ridge, and his body was never recovered. Another such description was of 22-year-old Harry Cummings of Port Rush, County Antrim. Just prior to his recruitment, Harry was described as follows. Slender, but husky-looking farm lad. Single, but has been on his own for two years. Parents, six brothers, one in army on farm leave, and five sisters. He's about halfway along in this large, happy farm family. Mild participant in softball and hockey. Hobbies are hunting and superficial tinkering with machinery. Reads action fiction and popular mechanics. Plays violin and harmonica by ear. Devout Roman Catholic, is a member of the Holy Name Society. Socially well-adjusted, has a steady girl. Farm lad of average interests and average ability, who wants to do mechanical work in the army, but does not appear very well qualified. He is very fond of the outdoor life, and for that reason infantry appeals to him as a second choice. He is considering going active, but has not yet made up his mind. Harry became a private in the Queen's own Cameron Highlanders of Canada. After six weeks of training in January 1944, his appraisal noted that he was an average soldier, lacks coordination in drill, and seems to get rattled easily. 
he is in good physical condition and his academic work is adequate. It had been intended that he would serve as a mortar man, but he appears to have proved too nervous around the weapon. Harry arrived in Normandy on the 18th of July 1944. Thirteen days later, he was killed in action on the line near saint andre sur orne Even in more recent times, those Irish in the service of Canada and the United States during the World Wars have failed to garner significant attention in Ireland. One Irish-Canadian connection to the Normandy campaign, which emerged as recently as 2005, is a case in point. Ralph Tupper Ferns had been born in Tipperary, most likely in Care, on the 18th of June 1919. He grew up in Toronto, enlisting as a private in the Royal Regiment of Canada in 1941. In August 1944, Ralph was among those engaged in the decisive engagement of the Normandy campaign, which led to the creation of the Falaise Pocket. He was reported missing in action on the 14th of August, and his body never recovered. 61 years later, a relic hunter in a quarry at haute Mesnil came across some artefacts, which on further inspection revealed the remains of a Canadian soldier. Three years later, in May 2008, after much work by the Department of Veteran Affairs, the body was identified as Ralph's. It transpired that he had perished during a friendly fire incident, when RAF bombers had mistakenly targeted the regiment's positions during the advance. Ralph Tupper Ferns was buried with full military honours at Brettville sur Leys Canadian War Cemetery on the 14th of November 2008. One of the Canadian units that landed on Juneau Beach on D-Day was the Regina Rifle Regiment. Among their number was 37-year-old rifleman Arthur Pierce, a lumberjack and ex-member of the Irish Guards from Drumshambo, County Leitrim. Another was 20-year-old rifleman Michael Rogan, a Canadian Irishman and amateur boxing champion whose parents were from Dramara, County Down. Both men were involved in more than a month of savage fighting, as they took on units like the 12th SS Hitlerjugend in the struggle for Caen. On the 8th of July 1944, though they likely never knew it, they were involved in an attack that had far-reaching consequences in seeing justice done for some of their fallen comrades. Their objective that day was the Abbe d'Ardennes, located just beyond the northern outskirts of Caen. The struggle for its possession proved immense, but eventually they drove the SS from the Abbey. There they discovered the remains of a number of Canadian servicemen who had been summarily executed by the SS after their capture immediately following D-Day, actions for which SS Standartenfuhrer Kurt Meyer was tried following the war. But neither Arthur or Michael lived to see either the capture of Caen or Meyer's trial. The Leitrim man was killed during the advance on the Abbey on the 8th of July. A photo of his grave and a memorial cross were later sent home to his mother in Drumshambo. Michael was wounded the same day. His field medical card charts the desperate efforts to save his life. Scribbled on the card are the details of his injuries. A penetration wound to his right chest, left ankle and left hand. Second degree burns to his right arm, right shoulder and the right side of his neck and face. From the firing line, he was taken to the men of 23 field ambulance, who at 0520 on the morning of the 9th July 1944 recorded that his dressing was changed. Michael was in shock and 1,000 cc's of plasma were administered. From there, he was evacuated to 86 General Hospital, where he arrived at 0730 hours. There he was again described as shocked. Between 0945 and 12 midday, plasma was administered a further five times, and sulfonamide paste was applied to his burns. His breathing was fast, colour pale, and pulse was still poor. By 1730, his condition was described as poor and his breathing embarrassed. At 1800 hours, the 20-year-old died. The medical casualty card of young Michael Rogan brings home the realities of what D-Day and the Normandy campaign cost. It was a sacrifice remembered by their comrades who survived. More than 50 years after jumping into Normandy, Irish-American paratrooper Ed Tipper brought his daughter back to France. Walking among the headstones of the Normandy American Cemetery, he remarked, These weren't just anonymous statistics. These were people that I knew, and I told my daughter, I said, This guy here died at age 19 or 20. A whole life never lived. No family. Nothing. No children. No opportunity to have some satisfaction of building a life. Nothing. Thousands of people, both soldiers and civilians, died in the effort to drive the Germans from France. 
Members of the Irish diaspora among the US and Canadian forces played a small but significant role in that effort. Let's hope that in the years to come, their stories, like those of the Irish and the British forces, begin to emerge from the shadows of Irish history. I hope you enjoyed this first episode of the Forgotten Irish Podcast. Please remember to follow along with the podcast or subscribe to the YouTube channel and the website if you'd like to keep up to date with new material. If you'd like to support the work that I do and gain access to exclusive content, you can do so at my Patreon site at www.patreon.com forward slash Irish ACW. See you next time. Oh,